During this interview, you will address me as your majesty. You should know that I control 98% of the people of your world. Do you not think that that entitles me to rate as royalty? So begins Napoleon Hill's infamous interview with the devil, which was so controversial that he was afraid to publish it while he was alive and it wasn't published until after his death. In this video, I'm going to show you how the devil controls 98% of people so that hopefully you can be one of the 2% who escape his control, or perhaps we can build it into an even bigger movement of people who escape his control. Now, let's start at the beginning. Who or what exactly is the devil? Well, according to the devil himself, he consists of all of the negative energy of the world, and that can be the energy of fear, of anger, of hatred, of jealousy. All of those things are the devil. Now, the opposite of the devil is God, and God represents all of the positive energy on earth. The devil refers to God simply as my opposition, and God consists of the love, the joy, the happiness, the contentment. Now, most of this book focuses on the tricks that the devil uses to control the minds of 98% of the people. And I'm going to focus just here on the first chapter. If you're interested in more, let me know down in the comments and follow my channel. But the devil says in this chapter that his very most powerful trick for controlling the mind is through fear. That when people are afraid, then they are under his control. And it doesn't matter what they're afraid of. It could be something real, it could be something made up, it could be something that's now, it could be something in a far-off future that may never even exist. As long as the devil can keep you in fear, then he keeps control of your mind. And specifically, he mentions six fears that are his most powerful tools, and those are fear of poverty, criticism, ill health, loss of love, old age, and death. Those are the fears that the devil uses to control us, and the two favorite ones, the two most impactful ones that the devil uses the most, are the first and the last, fear of poverty and fear of death. And fear of death is particularly effective because people are so afraid of what happens after death. Most people realize, whether consciously or unconsciously, that the soul does not just end at death. Right? As energy can neither be created nor destroyed, neither does the soul, which is made of energy, cease to exist as soon as the body dies. And because people generally don't know what happens after death, people are very, very afraid, and the devil has managed to get his allies to make people believe that there is eternal damnation, eternal torment that is awaiting them after their death. And by the way, I think this is a gross misrepresentation of what's in the Bible. The churches tell us that there's eternal damnation, that if you believe the wrong thing, then you're you're going to be tortured for eternity. Take a look at my other channel. I have a whole video all about that. It's called How to Escape from Hell, in which I go over what the Bible actually says about hell, as well as what just common sense and basic reasoning would tell you as well. Now, the devil says that when men started to think, he controlled men 100%. He did not have those 2% that were not under his control, because when men started to think, they thought in a primitive manner. They thought primally. They thought in terms of survival, and they were constantly on edge. They were constantly in fear, because anything could kill them at any moment. Eventually, men like Socrates and Confucius and Jesus came along and taught people to think positively, to think in a different way outside of fear. And as a result of that, the devil lost 2% of the human population, but he's actually pretty happy with his performance because 2% is not that much. The devil says he lives in the minds of people and he gains power from their negative thoughts. Again, those are the same negative thoughts, the fear, the criticism, the anger, the hatred, including after the person is dead, because again, the spirit does not cease to exist. The spirit continues to exist, and it exists in the same state that it was existing while it was alive. If the person was existing in a state of fear and anger and hatred during his life, then he's going to exist in a state of fear and anger and hatred after his physical body is cut off from him. Now, the devil says there are three ways that he prepares people's minds to be taken over by him. The first way is through poverty. The devil loves poverty because poverty discourages thinking. If people are worried about what they're going to eat, if people are worried about how they're going to pay their rent, they're not thinking clearly, they're living in fear. So if he can make people poor, people will be under his control. And that's why the devil discourages us from getting wealthy. That's why he puts people in the churches that tell us that being wealthy is evil. And he puts people in politics that say that the rich people are evil. And he encourages the sort of bad habits and bad thinking patterns and questioning ourselves and the excuses and all the things that keep us from making money. The second way is through ill health. The devil loves disease. The devil loves to get us to eat things and to do things to our body that hurt our health because bad health discourages thinking. 
And this is something that's true scientifically. If your body is not functioning at 100%, then your thinking ability is the first thing to go away. The thinking ability takes a lot of calories. It takes a lot of effort for your body to maintain. And so if your heart isn't even beating correctly, your ability to think is not high on the priority list for your body to address. And in fact, if you really stop to notice, you probably will figure out that certain foods and certain lifestyle habits will make you smart and some will make you really, really stupid. There's so much inflammatory food that we eat that fogs our brain, that gives us brain fog, that makes it difficult to think. And if you're interested in this topic, I, I recommend you check out Alex Becker's channel. He's got some great videos on this, but you can increase your IQ by 10 to 20 points just by eating better. So that's why the devil encourages us to eat bad food and keep ourselves unhealthy and probably encourages his friends in Washington to create things like the food pyramid that tell us to eat 6 to 11 helpings of gluten and empty carbohydrates and however many servings of milk, all things that are extremely inflammatory and fog your brain and make you dumber. The third thing he mentioned, which is kind of related, is liquor and cigarettes. Now, he doesn't really talk about the effect of liquor and cigarettes on the health, but rather the habits. That if you get in the habit of one of these behaviors, then it's really, really easy for you to fall into other addictions. It makes you more susceptible. And this is key, and this is something that nobody talks about. It ruins your concentration. If you've ever read the book uh, Deep Work by Cal Newport, which I highly recommend, he makes the argument that you can't really be very effective in a modern day thinking society unless you're able to think for extended periods of time uninterrupted. Now, I remember when I used to play in a rock band a long time ago and everybody in the band except for me smoked cigarettes. And I remember we would be trying to write a song and we'd we'd get some progress and we'd just be kind of getting in the groove 15 or 20 minutes and then all of a sudden everybody had to take a cigarette break. And so we leave, we'd go outside the band room, we'd spend half an hour on the stupid cigarette break we'd go back in and then we'd have to remember where we were and we, we'd have to start from scratch and we could our, our productivity was nothing because everybody had to smoke all the time so if you have any kind of addiction or any kind of habit that won't let you sit still for an hour at a time it is absolutely killing your chances of success Oh, and by the way, this is a pretty interesting insight because this book was written in 1938. The addictive nature of cigarettes was not understood in 1938. Most people thought that cigarettes were good for you back then. So it's kind of cool this book was so far ahead of its time. So how do you escape the devil's control? Well, he gives one very simple solution, and that is to control your emotions. Have self-control over your emotions. Because if you can't control your emotions, then you can't think straight. If you think about when you are attached to a belief, maybe you have a certain belief, maybe you have a certain belief that I contradicted in this video or that Napoleon Hill contradicted in his book. And when I say something or somebody else says something that contradicts what you believe, you start to get defensive. You start to feel as though you personally are being attacked just because somebody believes something different than you. And this may be a belief that was instilled in you by your parents or by your teachers, or maybe you don't even know where it came from in the first place, but you've had it for so long. Maybe it's something you just heard repeated over and over and over again, and you assimilated it into your subconscious mind, and now you believe that because you heard it so much, it must be true. And if that is the case, I'm not judging you. That's normal. That's the way people normally operate. In fact, we could say in the context of this discussion, that is the way that 98% of people operate. And so I don't care what your belief is. I don't care what side you're on. If you're not willing to stand back and look at it objectively and you start feeling like you're attacked and you feel triggered and you have to run away to your safe space when somebody disagrees with you, then you're never going to be able to think straight. And probably it's just a coin flip whether or not what you believe is true because you're not willing to actually criticize analyze it. Now, the devil says that his favorite device is mass fear. When everybody is afraid of the same thing all at the same time, that's why the devil starts wars. That's why the devil loves economic depressions. That's why the devil really, really liked a certain event that happened in the year 2020 that I'm not allowed to say on YouTube. And in fact, when this was written, this was written in 1938, at the beginning of World War II, before the United States of America had joined the war. And the devil says specifically, and I quote, my friends in Washington are helping me to get America involved in the war. 
That's interesting. We've all been told growing up that America were the big heroes, we were the saviors of the war, and that if it wasn't for us, then the whole world would have been destroyed. If you're an American, like I am, you've been had this beaten into your head your entire life. Well, that's interesting. Wonder if maybe we've been misled about that. I'm not taking a position either way, but it's something to think about. And by the way, if that th even the thought of questioning that offends you, then you need to work on your emotional control. Is it possible that you have been lied to about some things and that everything that was repeated into your head endlessly while you were in school might not all be completely accurate? Something to think about. Anyway, the devil says that he does not just control people who are rich and powerful, but he controls people from all walks of life. And in fact, he prefers people who are poor. As he said, he uses poverty and the fear of poverty to help him a lot. It's one of his favorite devices. And so people who are rich and powerful are a little bit more difficult to control because they're not afraid of where their next meal is coming from. So oftentimes what the devil has to do is up the ante and bribe them with even more money and even more power in order to fulfill his agenda. But with the poor, it's easy, which is why governments are so intent on keeping people poor, right? Because if people are poor and they are dependent on government to meet their basic human needs, then they are complete slaves. They have to do whatever the government tells them to do or else they don't get to eat. The devil uses the same device. Now, this book was written in 1938, so I'm curious about your opinion. If in 1938, the devil had control of 98% of the population, what do you think the numbers are like now? What percentage of the population does the devil control now? I'm curious to hear your opinion. Let me know in the comments. And I highly recommend that you check out this video where I show you how to deal with this economic crisis and how to even thrive during the crisis without falling into fear and being controlled by the devil. So check it out. I'll see you there. Ciao.